so, Rebel, I mean, we all hear the word all the time. It's spoken about a lot. People sing about it. People act like them. People look like them. Um, so it's been part of history. So what I'd like to do is start off about my rebellious path of how I got to where I got to as an executive creative director now. It started here. That's actually me. Um, I had a mohawk when I was a baby, so that was, that was a sign of things to come. Um, my mother told me I was a bit of a rebellious baby, believe it or not. I would sit up till 2 or 3 in the morning and uh, I wouldn't sleep. I wouldn't do anything normal. Um, so I think I was off to a good start. Then I got sick. So for about 10 years, I was in, in and out of hospital 26 times. I was a bit of a sick kid. I won't go into the details. I had a myriad of problems wrong with me, etc. Um, what I think that did to me, it brought out a bit of angst, a little bit of anger. And I think the rebel came out just a little bit more. Um, I thought it was me against the world, basically, because I was always in hospital, always sick. But it also made me very creative, I think, because I just would sit around with a notepad and a pen and uh, draw and scribble, etc. So I think it sort of, it helped the rebel come to life in a lot of ways. Then I left school at 15. So that was the end of my education. I got bored at school, I hated it. Um, I was a horrible student. Um, only thing I was good at was art, music, and uh, English and history, I think that was about it. The rest of it bored me. So I left. Luckily, in Australia at the time, you were allowed to legally leave school at 15. So that's what I did. And this happened. So. The mohawk came back, <laughs> and uh, the rebellious life uh, kicked into gear. Those are not my real eyebrows, by the way. <laughs> Through a childish, childish stunt with my friends um, trying to blow things up in a fire, I burnt off my eyebrows. So, so my friends kindly decided to paint eyebrows on me without me having a mirror nearby. So uh, never let your friends paint eyebrows on your face. That's, that's a lesson learned. So what did I do from 15 to 25? I did a lot of weird stuff. I was a bass player, I was a punk rocker, as you saw before. I was actually a roadie, so I know all about Test 1-2, that's why I was doing that before. Um, I started a clothing label. I actually studied part-time audio engineering to do that. I went on tour with rock bands as a lighting operator. Did film sets, hung around beaches, surfed. I even tried acting and modeling, and I sucked really badly. <laughs> it was a horrible thing to do, but I gave it a shot because Basically, I hadn't learnt anything. I didn't know how to do anything. And I was, I guess I was just being a rebel. So I was just trying anything I could. And, uh, and I was having fun at the same time. I did get into a movie, by the way, but they cut out my speaking part, but I'm still in the movie. So, so I did attempt that. So anyway, basically I was a rebel without a normal job. I mean, what am I gonna do? I don't know what to do, et cetera. I'm now reaching the age of, I think I was 23, 24, 25, something like that. I thought, what am I going to do with myself? And I don't actually know how to do anything, um, apart from all that previous stuff. Then I stumbled into an advertising course called Ad School. And it was actually set up by some guys who used to run another advertising course. And it was part time. It was one night a week and Saturday morning for three months, I think it was. Anyway, I somehow got myself into that course. And what it did, it actually helped teach me how to harness all this weird stuff I taught myself, everything from working on film sets to being a roadie, to all the strange things that I'd sort of taught myself over 10 years. It helped me kind of harness what I knew a little bit better. And then from 25 onwards to today, it took me into a, another path. So then I, become, I started off as an art director. I wasn't that crash hard as an art director, to be honest. So um, I found out I had a better gift for words, so I became a copywriter. Eventually that transitioned into being executive creative director, which is, this is my third time as an ECD. But I also did all these other things that actually came from my past. Like, I'm still involved in t-shirt, I co-design a t-shirt company in New York. Um, you know, I do all these other different things, video and everything else. Um, and I still surf. I'm just a much older skateboarder now, so I look really silly when I'm on a skateboard. So, you know, like, little kids look at me like, oh, really? Um, I'm still a punk, but I'm a little bit more zen now. I drink green tea instead of shots of tequila. So, so there's a little bit more of a change that happened there. And I managed to get to do that in a whole bunch of different countries, et cetera. And I've just moved back to Singapore after about almost eight years in New York. Um, so how did I do all that? Basically, I was a bad boy. Um, I broke rules. I just basically didn't want to listen to anybody. If you told me I couldn't do something, that was more of a challenge. It was like, really? OK, let's see. Um, 
so I never asked it, you know, to do anything. It was like, well, I'm going to give this a shot. I'm going to see what happens. What have I got to lose was my attitude. I mean, I didn't waste money on a degree. Not that you've wasted money on a degree. I don't mean that. <laughs> I mean, I didn't waste money on a degree because it would have been a waste because I probably wouldn't have listened to anybody. So I basically knew, because I wasn't that silly, that failure was always an option. I always knew I was going to try something. I didn't know what I was doing half the time. When I first went on the road with a rock band as a roadie, I didn't have a clue. I was a bass player, so I knew about bass. I didn't know about anything else. So I had to learn really quickly and watch what people did. And when I got my first job as a lighting operator for a large concert, uh, they actually asked me, the lighting guy didn't turn up. They said, can you do that? I went, yeah. And it was like, you know, <laughs> Um, I almost fried the band alive. They, I think they, they, uh, they all said, that was the most amazing light show. Can you just dim it down a little bit? Like, you know, we lost about 20 kilos during that set. <laughs> all right, lesson learned. Um, so failure was always an option, but I think it's good to have options. So, you know, you're going to fail, so what? Who cares? So what's the beauty of being a rebel, if there is a beauty to it? First thing is, there are no rules. You don't have to adhere to anything. Like if somebody puts you into a little box and says, you should do this, you should do this, you should do this, you'll listen to it. But if you've got no rules and there's no parameters, you just go, yeah, OK, I'll, I'll go there. I'll do that. You don't have to listen to those who say you can't do something. And I'll get into this a little bit later. It doesn't mean you have to be arrogant. It just means, well, yeah, OK, that's your opinion. OK, let's see what happens. You know, I mean, what the hell? And I love this saying, you never see statues of committees. There's a reason for that. Somebody made a decision, somebody went for something, somebody did something. Generally, a lot of rebels in business, the arts or whatever, they did it on their own. They, you know, they, yeah, sure, they had support, everything else, but they just went for it. You know, they just went nuts. And that's why you don't see statues of committees. Leaders, generally, are on their own. So I just want to take you through, and these slides are designed by me really quickly, so they're really basic. So, you know, and I also hate PowerPoint, so I just say that. Um, so three of my favorite rebels. Robert Rodriguez. I call him a rebel with a camera. Uh, does everyone here know who Robert Rodriguez is? Yeah? Yeah? OK, yeah. He's a um, famous film director. He did Spy Kids. But before, you know, he did Desperado. He's done a bunch of stuff. Does stuff with uh, Quentin Tarantino. Anyway, Robert Rodriguez made his first film with absolutely no experience and no money. Yeah, well, $7,000 is still no money in Hollywood. Um, what he did is he bought a 16 millimeter junky camera in a you know, secondhand store. Didn't have an instruction manual, didn't have anything. He didn't go to film school, he didn't know what he was doing, basically. So he uh, called up the manufacturer and said, how do I use this camera? Like, how does it work? And they told him over the phone how it worked. Went, okay, cool. Then he submitted himself to scientific experiments in labs to get the money, where they would test new drugs on his skin. He'd sit in hospital for weeks. They give him a few hundred dollars a pop to have some sort of weird thing done to his skin. That's how he made the money. Um, and then he, did, he just went, he went crazy. He went and filmed this thing. He got the crew to help him. He couldn't afford to hire a dolly for tracking shots, so he borrowed wheelchairs from hospitals. I mean, he did whatever it took to make a film. So he proved that you know, he could be a rebel in filmmaking. Richard Branson, we all know who Richard Branson is. And I know it's a bit of a cliche, Richard Branson the rebel. But he is, and I look up to him as a rebel in business. Um, he dropped out of school, so yay, got something in common. Um, he started a magazine called Virgin. A lot of people don't know that Virgin started as a magazine, not a record company. He turned that into a record label, and he did things that no one else was willing to do. In 1973, he released an album called Tubular Bells by Mike Oldfield. And uh, it went on to be a multi-million dollar success for him. That was the beginning. Then he signed bands no one else wanted, the Sex Pistols. Got got fired from every record label. He kept them. You know, he didn't let them go. He signed Boy George, etc. Then he turned that record label into an airline. And the airline came up against British Airways, who went out of their way to try and destroy him. They did everything they could, and he won. So, because he did it his way. Banksy. OK, maybe a bit of a cliche, but I admire Banksy. Um, as you know, he's a graffiti artist. He breaks all the rules. He's a rebel in the art world. A lot of people hate him, but he's successful. I was in New York all of October 2013, when he did his whole exhibition on the streets. He took over New York City, basically. The NYPD were hunting him down. They couldn't find him. I mean, they're out there catching people jaywalking, you know, and it's like they can't find Banksy. And every day, he's putting up a new piece of work. And, uh, you know, he sells work for a fortune. 
no one, well, not no one knows who he is. Most people don't know who he is. Um, a friend of mine had a great analogy for him. He said he's kind of like uh, the Riddler or some, some villain in a Batman film because he just sits there and calls in all this stuff. You know, it's like, let's do this. Let's take over Gotham City. So, um, and that's what he did. He took over Gotham City for a month and then disappeared and no one knew who he is. So it's, well, most people don't know who he is. Um, so they're, they're three rebels that I really admire. There are a lot more. There are tons more. But they're three people I really admire. So how to be a rebel? <laughs> Being a rebel is not for everyone, and it shouldn't be for everyone, and I don't expect everyone. Who here is a rebel? They think they're a rebel. Come on. Who here wants to be a rebel? <laughs> Who here is just to find out why rebels are so weird? <laughs> All right, so that solves that problem. Um, so welcome to rebel school. And because I don't like school, but I, I like rebel school, so that's OK. Um, don't be afraid to be different. That's one thing. If you really want to be a rebel, and that's in business, in art, in anything you want to do, it doesn't matter what it is, you can't be afraid to be different. You can't be afraid for people to look at you and go, you're weird, or, you know, like, I don't really, you know, think you're very cool, or whatever. It doesn't matter. Who cares? It's like, you know, you just got to go with what you want to go with. It's okay to ruffle some feathers, <laughs> because if you want to do things differently and be a rebel in anything, not everyone's going to agree with you. And you can't please everybody. It's impossible. So just be prepared that someone might go, you know, be unhappy with you and, you know, not be pleased. It's going to happen. Deal with it. Oops. Take risks. It's an obvious one, but you have to. If you want to be a rebel, you've got to take risks. I mean, you've got to go out. You've got to put yourself out there. Put yourself on that ledge and go, OK, I'm going to do this. I'm going to give it a shot. Um, if you're not willing to take risks, then it's, it's the wrong vibe for you to try and shake things up. It's just not going to work. And comfort zones are for mattress testers. If you, really, if you really want to be comfortable all the time, go and get a job at courts or something and test out mattresses or something. I don't know. But, you know, like, you know, it's just not going to work for you because you just can't be relaxed all the time. It's, you, you're going to have to challenge yourself. You're going to have to, um, you know, rattle yourself. So you're not going to be able to just live in a comfort zone. Now, this is a good one. Rebel versus stubborn. <laughs> A lot of people think rebels are stubborn people. They're not. It's actually very different. A rebel can admit they've made a mistake. A rebel should be able to admit they've made a mistake and move on and just like, OK, that didn't work, but I'm still going to do it this way and push on and you know, go and do it. You know, I'm still going to follow my path, but that didn't work. It was a bit of a hiccup. That's fine. Cool. Stubborn <laughs> dig their heels in and won't move and won't shift and won't change. And they cut their nose off to spite their face. They'll just sit there and go, no, 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 it's, oh, I'm going to keep doing it. No, it's like, no. Sometimes you've got to admit, it's just not working. It's, you know, it's simple. Also, there could be a, a little bit of a difference with like rebel versus rebellious. That's, there's also a little bit of a difference there. You can be rebellious, but that might be just because, I don't know, you've got an issue with somebody and you want to try and be different or something like that. Your parents annoyed you, so you went and dyed your hair 18 different colours. Been there, done that. Um, but, you know, but... Being stubborn isn't going to get you anywhere. You've, you've got to be able to roll with the punches and go with the flow. So, I have a bunch of rules that I actually rule my life with, in a way. I have five rules that I think of, and I tell people who know me this all the time. Um, and they're, they're, they're basically they're based on if I'm making a big decision. If I need to make a career decision, if I'm making a life decision, if I'm doing something, I ask myself five questions. Will it kill me? <laughs> I don't want to die. So even though I might be a rebel, I don't want to die doing it. I mean, that's just stupid. So, so if I look at the, the, the thing I've put in front of me, I go, will it kill me? No, OK, we're good. Will it kill someone else? Um, I don't want to kill anybody. Obviously, that's wrong. So I make sure it's not going to do that. So if I, I go, no, OK, that's cool. Will it hurt me? Now. I don't mind, you know, breaking a bone or getting a scratch or a scrape or something like that, losing a tooth, which I haven't. Um, but, you know, I don't want to get really hurt. And, of course, I don't want to hurt anyone else. And then the last one is my favourite. Will it put me in prison? <laughs> That's a good one because all the other ones could come out of this one. So it's like, so I don't want to end up in prison. So I'm not going to do anything silly, stupid, dangerous, illegal that could end me up in that situation. But you might be saying, but Rod, 
you know, I've got some questions about all those five rules. I mean, you know, you want to sort of go and do this and that's the only thing that's stopping you. Frequently asked questions to my five life questions because I've had them come at me a million times. What if I lose money? Yeah, so, <laughs> it's like, so what? I mean, it's not going to kill you, it's not going to hurt you. I mean, yeah, it might hurt you as in emotionally or ego-wise, but so what? You can bounce back from that. I've lost money, I've had business deals go, go awry and I've lost money in it, and it's like, you know, it happens. So what? Get over it. W what if I get fired? <laughs> this is like more if you're trying to be a rebel at work. I've been fired, <laughs> it's like, you know, if you're getting fired for actually following your passion, being who you are, and trying to make a difference, you're working for the wrong people, the wrong company. It's that simple. It's really that simple. So they did you a favor by firing you because they showed that you were right. My favorite, what if I fail? <laughs> it's going to happen. It's just going to happen. If you haven't failed at something, you actually haven't tried to do something. You haven't really made an effort to do something different. You've got to fail. Every major successful person on this planet has failed. Bill Gates has failed. Steve Jobs has failed. Everyone's failed. And if you're scared of failing, you're not cut out then to be a rebel because you're not willing to take risks. As I said before, you're not willing to put yourself out there. Uh, you know, have I ever been fearful of failure? Absolutely. But then I go back to my five rules. Is it going to kill me? Is it going to hurt me? Is, is it going to put me in prison? Um, it's like, if I do that, I go, okay, it's okay to fail, because I can come back from that. I can't come back from being dead. And I can come back from being in prison, but I don't want to. Um, so that's basically it. That's sort of my, my take on being a rebel. Um, you know, sorry, sort of flying through it all, because, you know, be able to get to questions, etc. But because of the time of day, and I so need more coffee, um, because of the time of day, I'll leave you with a parting message from Banksy. And that's it. Thank you. So, does anyone have any Q&A? We've got some time for Q&As. Hit me, come on. Be a rebel. <laughs> I didn't start Bannister. Actually, she did. <laughs> I joined Bannister. Uh, Why did you join? Um, I joined because I was, working, I was working in the advertising industry for a long time. And I left uh, major advertising agencies in 2007, and I vowed never to return. And um, so I said it's not going to happen. On a full-time basis, I would consult. I would do all that type of stuff. I'll be brutally honest. I just didn't find a lot of ad agencies, and this is in context of this talk, rebellious enough. Like, you try to do something different, oh, you can't do that, you know, the board of directors don't like, oh, the CFO said we can't do this. You know, it's like, and I went, you know what, I can only really work for independence if I want to work for anyone. And um, in all honesty, I've been talking to Yuko, the founder of Bannerstar, for three years. It's a long time to convince me, <laughs> to get me to go there. Um, but they were independent, they, they don't want to sell out, they don't want to be part of anything like that. And, and Yuko is willing to let me be a bit rebellious in some of our plans and our ideas, so that's why it was a big tick, and yep, that's why. Come on, it's supposed to be rebels. <laughs> Hit me. What is the most valuable thing you've ever done? Wow, I don't think I'm allowed to say that if it's being recorded. Um, <laughs> It's the most rebellious thing I've ever done. Oh, I don't know, being, you know, going on the road with, you know, hardcore rock and roll bands, and I can't even tell half of those stories. Um, I'm sworn to secrecy. Um, um, making, you know, even making like instant decisions. Um, I was in Sydney in a good job and a good situation, and I got made an offer to move to Singapore in 1999. Uh, I'm, I said yes on the spot. I didn't even think about it. So yeah, I didn't tell anybody. <laughs> it was like, I didn't tell my girlfriend, I didn't tell anyone, I just said yes, I'm going. And it was like, yeah, it wasn't an easy thing to explain later on, but it was like, yep, I'm gonna do it. You know, five things, what's it gonna do? Okay, cool. And it didn't hurt her, trust me, but you know. But, um, but yeah, I think there was that, and um, I think just, you know, doing whatever I wanted to do was, I guess, a pretty rebellious thing in a lot of ways. 
Yeah. Okay, <laughs> there's a good one. Um, I gotta tell you something, like, I've been away for seven and a half years and I find Singapore a different country that I left seven and a half years ago, completely different uh, in so many ways. Um, there's more art, um, like Artscape that happened recently, I went down to. There was art being shown there that wasn't allowed to be shown when I was first here in 99. So that's a little bit of a change. Um, I feel there's more of a creative surge here now. I'm really feeling it. You've got people like Colt Gallery, Steve Lawler. Um, you know, his gallery is really cool and different. It's not like a standard art gallery. And I, and I see a lot of people doing different things. I see more bands. I hear about more sort of underground bands, etc. So I feel, I mean, you know, I feel there's a bit of rebellion creeping up in Singapore, in a way, in a good way. That's why I left advertising. <laughs> <laughs> All right, you've got to you got to choose your battles. I mean, you can't just be you know a thorn in somebody's paw all the time. That's not going to work. Um, you've got to you can't just want to change the world for change just because you want it changed. You've got to pick your battles. If you can, you know, if ten percent of what you do starts changing, you know, if you do little bits and, and chip away at doing things, if you just want to change everything overnight, that's never going to happen. It's just not going to work. But if you want to sort of do little bits and pieces and sort of build a, you know, build a wall slowly of something, you know, you've got a better chance. If you just come out guns blazing, then, you know, it's not going to work. And you might get fired. <laughs> Trust me, it happens. Um, anyone else? Come on. Some of the work I'm doing at the moment. Uh, wow, yeah, some of it we can't discuss because it's confidential. Um, you mean at Bannister? Yeah. Right, okay. Uh, we're doing, you know, packaging uh, design for a dairy company in Japan. I've got to be careful how much I say. Um, that we're launching in Southeast Asia. Uh, we're doing that. But we're also, we're evolving the business in a way, whereas we've got our solid base of clients and work that we're doing. But we're also looking at how we can develop products and like what can we do. And that's sort of something I wanted to do in, in agency life, but no one wants to do it. So it's kind of like, well, we, we come from, Bannister comes from a um, branding design, package design background. So we're going, well, why don't we create our own products? Like, why don't we start developing them? Like, you know, put ourselves out there and say, well, we understand all this. We know how to package something. We know how to brand something. So, and we're supposed to be ideas people, so let's just dream up the ideas and put it out there. So we're working heavily on that at the moment. So, you know. And on top of that, we've got really good work that we're doing across the board for clients like um, P&G. It's one of our biggest clients. Doing a lot of nice work there. Um, there's a lot happening at the moment. Are you using environmental materials? And is that a consideration <coughs> when you're designing? And well, yeah, it all depends on the client and you know, what it is. I mean, you don't have complete control all the time, but we want to we wanted do good things wherever we can. I mean, you don't have complete control over everything. Not when you're, when you're working in a commercial world, that's almost impossible to say, yes, it's 100% planet friendly, because it's not. I mean, you know, my sneakers are probably not planet friendly. You know, it's like, you know, probably somebody, something died to make my sneakers. I mean, it's probably a fact of life, but you know, we try to do what we can to be as good as we can. So, you know, that, that is something that's part of our manifesto. So. What is the most extreme rebellious thing you want to do within your five rules? <laughs> um, I've got this thing that I want. I've just, I've just recently, last week, turned 48. So I'm getting on, getting old. And um, I recently announced to my friends, I've got this thing, I want to do 50 things by 50. All right. And some of those things are insane. Um, and I've sat down with some of my friends explaining what I want to do, and they just stare at me like, are you kidding? Um, and I could break some of my five rules. Um, one of them is I want to attempt to surf a 50 to 60 foot wave. Right. But I'm putting a little disclaimer in there is when I get out there on the boat and I look at it and I go, you, no way. And it's like, you know. <laughs> I'm putting that out there that then let's go and find a 15 footer and see how we go. So it's like, I mean, I grew up surfing, but I've never surfed a monster towing wave. So that's sort of one of the 
rebellious things. I'm actually thinking of putting a band back together. Um, I haven't played in a band for a long time. So I think it's about time before I get too old, too old to do it, and go and play a few, few concerts for fun. Call up some of the old guys and say, let's do it again. And yeah, so I want to do stuff like that. It's a bit rebellious, I guess, in a way. But this time, but this time, sorry? Yeah, no, that's not happening, trust me. <laughs> What's happening under here ain't no mohawk. That's like, you know, so. This is what happens when, again, you let your friends dye your hair. You know, it's like, when you're 15 years old and your friends go, no, it's fine, it's, it's good, no, no. Why does it feel like I've got acid on my skull? It's like, you know, so yeah, so no, just a few, just a few fun things that I consider mildly rebellious. You know. But I probably won't have a bottle of Jack Daniels on my amplifier anymore. It might be like green tea or something. So, yeah. so. Any, anyone else? Yep. Do you sell rebellion to your clients, or do you? Is it more about competence no. or you know? No, you don't really sell rebellion to your clients. I think what you've got to do is just try and push the envelope a bit when it comes to ideas. You know, you do what you can to push ideas a bit further and seeing how far you can take it. That's being, yeah, that's sort of being a rebel. If you want to sit, you know, you, you don't just sit there and say, yeah, okay, yeah, whatever. You want to try and push it a little bit. So that's rebellious, but you don't have to sell rebellion to your clients. That's not their job. You know, it's your job as a creative person if you're in that field to just try and push the envelope a bit, not get too comfortable, you know, test the water, see how far you can go. I always said whenever I had young creatives, I wanted them to reach, reach for the moon because I can always bring them back down to the clouds. It's like, if they try really hard to do something really out there, that's good because I can always wind them back a bit, so. And do you have a standout campaign from your career history where you really push those boundaries? Um, wow, let me think. I've got to be honest with you, like, you know, I mean, I've done a lot of, I've been in this business 22 years, so I've done a lot of things. Um, standout campaign where I've pushed it. Um, to be honest, my favourite ad I ever did was my first ad. And that's the weirdest thing in my entire career. That's my favourite ad. Like, I just started in the business and somehow talked my way into this business and I still didn't know what I was doing. And I was making it up as I went along. I was just you know, ad-libbing the whole thing. And, um, and a guy who used to make my surfboards asked me to do an ad for him. And he said, I'm about to run some ads. He said, you do this advertising thing now, don't you? Like, thing. I went, yeah, I do that thing now. And um, he said, I want an ad. I'm buying pages in magazines that are in the US, Australia, South Africa, uh, and somewhere else. I can't remember where. He was exporting boards, finally. He, you know, this is way back when. This is in the 80s. No, 80s, 90s. What am I saying? I'm dating myself even further. Um, not enough coffee. Uh, so this is in the 90s, uh, early 90s. And um, so it's about 95, I think, 94. can't remember. But I'd only done really basic ads until then, and then I had this opportunity, and the brief was, do whatever you want. And I went, okay. But he said, but it can't have a surfer in it, and it can't have a wave in it. I went, okay, that's interesting. So I went away and, and freaked out, and then I came back with this idea, which was um, a shot of a switchblade knife with a surfboard coming out the end, and it just said designed to cut through water, right? And that was my first ad, so first real ad. And he loved it, and it ran around the world, and blah, 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 and the switchblade was actually mine. So, <laughs> so that was a rebellious thing. It's from my punk rock past, and uh, I never used it on anyone. It was just, it looked cool to have a switchblade, that was all, you know? So when people go, ah, oh, wow, that's cool. So, um, so I did that, but the reason it was my favourite ad, I guess, of all time, uh, I went surfing in Hawaii when, after the ad came out, and I walked into a surf shop uh, in Hawaii to buy some wax, and I walked in there, and my ad was stuck behind the counter on the wall, with just with um, sticky tape, sellotape, whatever you call it, stuck on the wall. I didn't say, oh, it's mine, um, because that would have been really uncool. But, um, <laughs> It just made me smile, and I went, wow, actually this ad connected with who it was supposed to connect with. Real surfers are sticking it on their wall. And I was proud of that, because I never got to see anything like that. I never got to see that kind of reaction to something I created, and it made me, just made me smile, that's all. So, yeah, cool. Anyone else? Yep. How do you express your travel these kind of clients? Well, that's what I was saying. Like, it all depends on what the, what the thing is. What I'm saying, you can be a rebel by just trying to push the creative work a little bit more. If you want to sort of be safe and sound, you don't actually try to push it. 
you know, you try and push what you're doing. And I mean, there's a volume dial with clients. You know, some clients you can take it up to 11, my favorite one. You know, like, you know, obviously from Gotta Love Spinal Tap. Um, but, you know, you can't do that for everyone and it's unrealistic. And that's what I was saying about rebel versus stubborn. Like, you've got to know your limitations and you've got to be able to shift and sway and move. A stubborn person will go, no, 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 you've got to do it this way. And it's like, I hate those people. It's like, you know, it's like, okay, well, no, it's not going to work. It's like, change it, you know, it's, it's just being silly. So you can't make, you know, I can't, you know, on a, on a, a big client ad, I can't put babies with mohawks in the ads all the time, much as I would like to, you know, you, you just don't do that. You know, so you've got to be, there's an element of being smart in being a rebel. You don't get somewhere by being a dumb rebel. You know, like Richard Branson, I wouldn't say is a dumb rebel, you know, and he does crazy things, but he also knows how to pull it back as well. So you've got, you've got to balance it out. Um, well, I guess we don't, I must admit now that I've joined Bannister, it's more like a family, not like a team, you know, we sort of, we don't have that solid, in agencies there's this real hard structure, hardcore structure, we all sort of sit around and hang out in the same area, uh, that doesn't feel corporate, I mean I feel like I'm sitting around with a bunch of friends, you know, it's like, it's got a different vibe to it, and, and we're small, we're 15 people, so, you know, I, I did some, before I came back here, I was freelancing for a major agency in New York before I, before I moved here. And um, it was, I don't know, almost 2,000 staff. And, <laughs> and everyone in really open plan long tables. And it was horrific. And, you know, and um, just not a lot of fun. So when it's small, it's a much easier thing. But when you're in an agency, like I said, you know, when you're working in a creative team thing, if you're actually in, a, in an old school, writer, copywriter, situ I mean, writer, copywriter, coffee, uh, writer, um, art director situation, um, there's going to be clashes. <laughs> uh, there's going to be, I want to do it this way, I want to do it that way. I, wanna, I mean, I've had that my entire career. It's just a fact of life. Unfortunately, you've got to somehow find common ground um, and how to do it, and that takes time. And eventually trust, if you've worked with somebody for a long time, it comes down to trusting them. I, the best relationship I had in a creative team situation um, was with a guy I worked with in Australia. We were together for like two and a half years. And I was the copywriter, he was the art director, but quite often I would art direct and he would copyright. And we'd swap roles just for fun. And the client never knew, but you know, it's like <laughs> they do now because this has been recorded. Um, but you know, we would, just, we would just go, yeah, why don't you art direct this one? Hey, why don't you write this one? And, you know, and we did it for major. We did it for major clients and, and the ads went really well. So I think sometimes it's got to, it's, it's a balance and you've got to be fair with each other. So, you know, if you, it's again where it's rebel versus stubborn. If someone digs their heels in, then it's not going to work, you know, so. Great. All right. Thank cool. you so much. Thank Thanks you. So much. <laughs> oh, and by the way, happy Valentine's Day. Everyone. Yeah, totally. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.